Welcome, everyone. Uh, in the previous two talks, uh, you went through SNEA's uh, computational storage and uh, programming model. And in the, pre in the last one, you went through the NVMe's uh, computational storage uh, development. Uh, my name is Oscar Pinto. I'm going to talk about uh, computational storage with respect to uh, the APIs and how you can program the device. So uh, in our agenda today, we have, uh, we'll, we'll touch on the computational storage APIs. We'll touch on the programming model, specifically how you can discover computational storage resources and how you can configure them. And once you have them configured, how uh, uh, you can use them by discovering the specific CSFs. I think we, we had some questions on this. So we can walk through that, and also how you can execute that from an application perspective. And with that, we'll also uh, touch on a programming example. And uh, we will cover a little bit on how these APIs and NVMe work together. Now, uh, there will be more in detail that uh, Bill will cover later on, but this is just an example from the uh, API perspective. And, and lastly, uh, we will conclude this here. So, so let's start with uh, the CS APIs. Uh, some of this material may, you may have seen before, so I apologize for that. But I want to say that uh, this is work in progress, and whatever you see here is uh, subject to change. So uh, from the SNEA perspective, what we thought was we develop a set of APIs that are common that work across a different type of devices. Jason and Scott touched on uh, CSD, CSP, and CSAs. So basically different ways to look at a computational storage device. So we are saying we have one set of APIs that work across, work across all these three types of devices. Now the APIs uh, are abstracted and they are agnostic to the type of hardware. They, so they hide the device specific details they hide how they're connected, whether they're connected local, remote, or the specific device uh, type. And that could be a FPGA type, it could be an accelerator, it could be a NVMe type uh, storage uh, CSD, and, and so forth. So uh, what the APIs try to achieve is don't expose the device specific details, but rather keep it agnostic to a level that the same set of APIs apply to all of them. Now. Uh, that abstraction covers uh, different aspects of the device, basically discovery, uh, how you discover the device, how we go about accessing it. Memory, I, I think there's a question on memory. So the way we have defined memory is memory could be mapped. That is, it is visible in the host address space, uh, something typical of how FPGA GPUs do. Or it could be not mapped, and that's what we are trying to do on the NVMe side, where the there is device memory, but it is not mapped to the host virtual address space. And then we kind of define how, how uh, you can do near storage access, that is how uh, data could be moved from storage into that memory that is close to compute, and how we can uh, um, facilitate uh, data movement within the device so, so that it doesn't Cross the device boundary, uh, which is where we get the benefit of a, one of the benefits of computational storage. We also have a definition for how you could copy data from that device memory. Uh, that is, copy the data uh, between host and device or between device memories. We also have definitions of how you could download uh, the CSFs or the functions and execute those functions and then so forth. Now, uh, one of the benefits you get with the abstracted interfaces is that it completely hides any vendor-specific implementations that you may have. So totally agnostic to a level that you could do whatever you want within, that, uh, uh, within your device and your device stack. The, the way we do it is uh, we have some, uh, an extensible interface that is covered by uh, what we call as plugins. And the plugins is basically uh, a mapping layer between the APIs 
and your specific device stack. So you can think about the APIs as basically a mapping exercise between an abstracted interface to your specific device. And lastly, uh, the APIs are supposed to be OS agnostic. And that is, they're not specifically tied down to a specific OS. So you could implement this in whichever flavor of OS you want. Another thing that I should mention here is uh, the APIs have also been crafted in a way that they could work with the traditional uh, device stack that you see, that you have a classic uh, user space library and a kernel device driver. So you could work in this model. You could work in an all user space uh, usage model way. Today you have drivers in user space. Or you could work also in all, uh, all this working in kernel space. Um, there may be one or two things that you may have to compromise on, on the interface type, but overall the APIs have been de defined in a way that they could work in all these three uh, configuration models. So, so uh, what, what we're seeing on the, uh, the figure on the right is basically covering the API library, uh, a plugin interface, maybe a few set of plugins, depending on what device you have and the type of features that you want to bring in. Uh, a typical device driver that connects with your uh, specific device, and the familiar uh, device fig uh, CSD figure that you had seen in the past uh, that can host uh, one or more uh, uh, CSFs, computation storage functions, and there are some examples that are shown in this figure. So uh, we have a spec out uh, and that is up for public review. It's a point eight spec. Uh, please make a note of that uh, URL and snare.org public review if you're online, just have a look at it. So you can get access to the latest spec. We had uh, a point five as the last public review. And since then, I'd like to give you an update on what we have done. Uh, so we worked on how you can um, discover the compute resources that uh, the device comes with. And with that, we worked on the type of the APIs, that how we can query, how we can configure those resources. We also simplified that whole model on how you look at the, um, the compute resources by themselves to make it uh, simpler for configuration so that the practical usage of it is your execute and runtime. And, and that way we kind of separated how you discover and configure and how you execute them. So a couple of changes since then uh, on the configuration of the resource uh, usage on how you download and configure your CSFs, that is your functions, and also how you can discover these functions once you are connected to the device so you can address that particular function by, uh, let's say, an ID, and then uh, run run that specific uh, CSF. So these are uh, some of the changes that uh, have been adopted since the last update. Uh, one of the things, as you see in the last line, is the CSF. We've also defined CSFs to have characteristics wherein you could choose um, if you have more than one CSF of the same type by its performance or by its uh, power saving, that is, uh, you may have one implemented, let's say, in a low power embedded CPU, or you could have one um, uh, written in probably an ASIC or an FPGA and so forth. So you can have the choice if you have more than one uh, CSF to uh, discover it by its characteristics and then choose that for your execution. Totally depends on what is the type of environment you want. Okay, so this is a brief overview of uh, the APIs that we have uh, defined. This is not the exhaustive list, but this is just some of the key ones that I touched on earlier and um, what they basically do. So with that, let's get to the programming model. So I'd like to uh, define the programming model in five steps. Uh, the first one being you discover your resources. So this is basically you're discovering your CSX. What are the different resources that you have? And um, you, you walk down that list and you, then you figure out what exactly is the type of device you have. 
The second one is once you have discovered your resources, you want to configure them, and you want to configure them in a specific way. It could be for a, a particular user, or it could be more than one user. Maybe you have a multi-tenant environment of some type. Um, so you have the ability to configure your device to that particular uh, usage. Once you have configured your uh, resources, specifically your environment, for your uh, execution usage, then the next thing you will want to do is configure your CSFs. So CSFs by default are uh, not activated. And I, I think we touched on this in an earlier um, uh, presentation that uh, you need to activate your CSFs uh, to be usable. So we have a separate step for that as part of uh, configuration. So on the bottom, what you see is uh, these are, we term these as uh, privileged operations. That is, you don't do this every time you want to execute. You do it once, and, and once it is done, you would go to the next step, which is your normal operation, which is and discover the ones that have been activated, and then you go and execute uh, those uh, CSFs. I've also shown in the last line that uh, steps one and two may be pre-configured. That is, the manufacturer would have have them built in, that you don't need to make any of these changes. They come pre-configured, and they are in a certain state that uh, you cannot change. They're already configured. So uh, it's a, we can say it's a fixed state. In addition, the manufacturer may expose some of the CSFs as al always activated, and that, that is possible. So in which case, steps one and two and three may be uh, pre-configured options. And we may probably see in the early devices that come out in the market that you have a pre-configured device with a fixed functionality, be it uh, for storage uh, services, be it for data analytics and so forth, right? So this would be uh, the typical uh, programming model that we'll touch on. And we'll, we'll pick each one of these and, and walk through how we can go through this uh, programming models using the APIs. We have touched on this in detail uh, from, uh, with Jason, but I just want to cover this from a different point of view. So I want, to look, want you to look at this figure, and if you remove the storage, what, what is highlighted as storage, if you remove, remove those boxes, it becomes your CSP. You add the, the storage in the device, it becomes your CSD as it is shown. And if you add additional control software, and, uh, and, and so forth, uh, and maybe some additional storage that may be part of the same device or it may be distributed, it becomes a CSA, then a storage array. So I just wanted to distinguish this as uh, this is a starting point on the, uh, the device that you have at hand and how you discover it. So uh, let's touch on CSFs. So uh, with CSFs, uh, what you have on the top right is the, the basic uh, definition as per the spec. But CSFs in general, we can have two types. One is they are pre-installed uh, by the manufacturer. That is, they are fixed. You cannot remove them. You cannot unload them. And also, uh, they could be activated by default. but some manufacturers may give you the ability to activate and deactivate. The reason you have this ability of activating and deactivating is your device is only of a fixed size, and whenever a function is activated, it takes some resources on the device, be it some memory, or be it some scratch space, and so forth. So you cannot, uh, let's say you have downloaded multiple uh, CSFs, and it, it's possible that you cannot execute all of them. So you may have to activate some, or you may have to deactivate some, but you may not be able to activate and use all of them at the same time. And that's the reason you have this activate and deactivate, so you could use the resources accordingly. And um, lastly, uh, uh, the CSF on the, the fixed part, the uh, manufacturer part, they would be fixed. That is, they have a, a certain requirement on what they can do, and that's about it, that's all you get. Um, whereas in the downloaded uh, part, where, where in, uh, CSFs can be downloaded to the host, when you download, they go into what we call in SNEA terms as the repository. So once they are in the repository, 
they are in a state that they cannot be used, but they, they can only be configured to be used. Right? And that is, you have to walk through the configuration steps, that you have to pair it with some other resources, basically the environment, and then uh, you have to activate them and then you can use them. So, so these uh, CSFs that are downloaded can also be unloaded. And like I said, they could be activated, deactivated. And, and depending on the environment that the CSFs are running in, you could have multiple copies of this. And uh, for example, let's say you have an embedded CPU environment, you can have more than one copy of this. And that copy totally depends on um, how you activate it and how you download it. And, and, and depends on the uh, CSF type. Okay, so with that, let's, let's go into the first part, which was uh, discovering resources. So we have an uh, API called Query Device Properties. Uh, basically what it does is it takes a device handle, and I have not touched on a device handle. Um, so let me talk about how we manage uh, the API. So since the APIs are abstracted, we also abstract the access and the resources by a handle. So the handle is basically an opaque uh, entity that um, is provided to the host user, but internally uh, from the API and the implementation, that handle can map to that specific resource and the basic uh, workings of that resource. So you, you have, prior to this, you have already accessed the device by basically saying open device. And once you have opened that uh, device, you get a device handle. So using that handle, you can query uh, specific resources, uh, resources that are there on the device. So we have defined uh, resources uh, as shown here, uh, uh, CSX, which is basically the whole device by itself. And within that, you can have different uh, resource types. And uh, we touched on this earlier, but basically you can have a computation storage engine uh, you can have one or more of those. You can have a competition storage execution environment. This is the environment that engine is running in uh, that the CSF runs within. And then you can have uh, basically the functions, the CSFs, or you could have a vendor specific implementation that is undefined, but we give that option that uh, you could do something like that. And the figure on the right kind of represents kind of the hierarchy of how these resources fall through, so you have the CSX, and you could have different engine types. So engine types could be taken as, um, as an example I gave earlier. Uh, you have an embedded CPU as one, an FPGA as another. Uh, you could have an ASIC, a dedicated hardware. Three different engine types, and each of them have a different working environment, physically working environment, right? So they have their own execution engine, they have their own execution environment, and also their own CSF, because the CSF for that execution environment cannot run on another engine. And I think somebody raised that question earlier, and this kind of figure kind of uh, shows that uh, differentiation that um, the CSC, CSC, and CSF is dependent on the engine type. Now, a vendor may abstract an engine, may not just show an embedded CPU or an FPGA uh, in its raw form, may show an environment that may contain uh, more than one engine type as an abstracted engine. And it could be in that uh, execution environment, they could use uh, embedded CPU to trigger off an FPGA and maybe some hardware uh, IP of, of, of some type, right? So they could abstract that in a way that that resource may come up as one engine. But overall, when you discover it, you, you will get, uh, the, by, when you discover by resources, you will find them in, in this order. So how do these uh, resources look like? So here is the hierarchy looking at from the programming level. So it's each of them once, um, let me go back. So as input, you give the type. And as output, you provide a buffer, which is your properties. And it is a union of any of those, because you, you can select only one type. And the length says what's the size of your buffer. So as output, you can get one of, one of these uh, resources. 
and they are uh, segregated by properties, and each of those properties could have further details embedded within. Yes? Sure, so the question was, is, is there something like a namespace for the discovery? So as you know, at, at SNEA, what we're trying to do is we are trying to abstract uh, namespace specific functionality from NVMe side, but also if you have some other namespaces, we want to abstract that to a level that it becomes a resource, and within that resource, you could, you, uh, that resource could actually map to that namespace that you, uh, of your choice. So. Uh, then mapping would be provided underneath the layers. Um, you don't exactly uh, you don't exactly get to the NVMe namespace as is, but you get to, get it to a resource which actually maps to that NVMe namespace. Uh, does that answer your question? Probably yes, it depends what you're looking at from the application point of view, so that's a good question though. So if you have one namespace, um, how would you, um, across CSXs, how would you query it? Yeah, so the discover we have another discovery wherein um, your actual usage comes with uh, CSS, so the way we have structured the, uh, the APIs like I touched on earlier is you discover all your resources, but once it is configured, your actual usage comes by, you really need that CSF, the function that you want to execute on a specific CSF for that, let's say, namespace, and, and there you go, then you go and execute. And the APIs are structured in, in such a way that you can find a specific function across all these CSXs in one time, and then go and execute, yeah. So that's the five steps that I touched on earlier. Okay, so, uh, Getting down to the resources, as you can see, each, each property has embedded uh, information on that specific resource type, and that specific information can be further broken down, like in the case of uh, the computational storage uh, engine, could be broken down to a computational resource, a compute resource. Now, a very good example of this is the CSE info could be your embedded CPUs by themselves, and that's the whole execution environment. And within that, compute resource could be CPU1, CPU2, and, and so forth. So you can, later on when you configure, you can select, I want to run this program on CPU1, on uh, engine Y, and so forth. The blue boxes, uh, I will get to it in the next step, so that's basically your activated instance, that is once you're configured, they turn blue. Uh, not necessarily blue in this fashion, but I'll, I'll walk through those steps. So the next one is uh, once you have discovered all your resources, you will get a list of different resources that, uh, that your CSX has. You would next go and configure your environment that your resource wants to run. So. Uh, as shown here, um, the execution environment that you want to configure is basically your pairing your execution engine, CSE, with your uh, environment. So you pick those two together and then you activate it. Now, you cannot pick any of them. You cannot pick from a CSE from one type with an execution environment of another type. So uh, the properties and the, is the info that I touched on the earlier slide, uh, the info, so each of these have embedded within them what we call as a CSE token. So that token basically says, so with this token information, this CSE can run in this type of environment and can execute these type of uh, uh, CSFs. So only the tokens that match can be configured together. And yeah, so basically you, you pair them together and then you, uh, you do the configuration. And what you get there is as part of configuration is you, you pick your engine, you pick your execution environment, and each of them have some IDs that uniquely identify 
your engine with your execution environment. And once you activate them, you get an activated instance, which is your blue box. And along with that, you get uh, 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 the instance has the activated ID. Now you, you use that ID to configure your CSS, which is your next step. So you can only use activated instances to um, uh, execute your CSFs. This could very well be the activated instance could very well be, you, maybe you have uh, embedded Linux, right? So the, the notion of activating it is basically you're kicking off probably a VM of some type that, and you have made it ready so that you can now um, run programs in that execution environment. So like I said, activation takes resources and you can visualize what, it, uh, what basically activation does here. Okay, so next, the third step is uh, let's configure the CSF. A again, the, the API is the same, but here what we do is the configuration info is uh, we, instead of passing a CSE, we pass a CSF. And it's a union, CS, CS config info that, that is shown there is a union of, uh, of uh, the different uh, activation types. So in this activation, what we do is we take that activated CSEE that we did in the earlier step, and then we take a, a CSF that is either in the repository or we download it. I'm not shown that step here, but you can download a CSF before this, which uh, falls in the repository. So we pick that up and we activate it. And by activating it, you create an instance of the CSF, which I'll show you in the next step we create an instance of the CSF. And along with that, um, that, that CSF that you activated, you can also specify the compute resource that you want that to run with. So earlier, I, I did say that you can attach it to a CPU, maybe one, maybe more than one, as, as an example of uh, embedded CPU. So basically that is what activation does, that uh, you can tailor your uh, CSFs to execute on a specific uh, uh, compute resource, and that activation holds good till you deactivate it. So this is as good as uh, affinitizing a particular uh, running uh, program to a particular CPU. And only activated uh, CSFs can be executed. You could, it, it totally depends on what the vendor lets you do. It, it's again the execution environment that the vendor provides you. So you could have different types of implementations that, uh, and we provide that flexibility on how you want to, uh, what to say, uh, activate it. And that token that I said earlier, that holds the unique key on what the vendor chooses to do with the device. And, and the resources that are exposed. Okay, so we have discovered the basic resources, the compute resources that came with the device. We have activated our execution environment, and we have activated our, um, what to say, the CSFs. So once we have the device set up and ready for execution, the next step would be to discover your uh, CSFs. Now we have two APIs for this. And the first one is you query across um, a specific device and that could be a path and the, and the path could be your uh, execution path, uh, be it a file system, be it a device, or it could be also specified as a null. That is, I want to uh, scan across all my CSXs that are available. So it gives you that ability. One thing that we have done with uh, the APIs is we have tied it to storage. As you can see, the path is, is one of the things that we let you discover with. So we have another API to just discover CS, uh, the uh, CSXs, that is your computational storage device. You can just discover whether you have a computational storage device and a specific path. So it makes it very simple because in the end, you're working with storage. That's the whole notion behind the 
computational storage. So we are tying it with two storage, and the storage can be specified by a path. So here the discovery is, in this path, do you have a specific CSF, or, or do you have CSFs, right? And it kind of tells you whether you have uh, computational storage devices um, on your system. So null would give you, if you have 20 drives, uh, and maybe five of them are computational storage drives, you may get five back and the names of them and how, you, how to address them. Now that is basic functionality on how to discover the, the uh, devices that have specific functions. An example would be, I want to know all the computational storage devices that have compression, right? And if that is the case, um, you can do this query and your buffer would be filled with uh, the, um, the CSXs that are there. And once you have that, you could open the device and then query by that specific name, like compress, right? And, and the second API basically does that. You specify that specific um, CSF that you want in question. And from that, you would get a, a structure, which is basically your info that I touched on earlier, which is you get information on what that CSF is about. One is it gives you an ID that you can use for execution, but secondary, it tells you its relative performance or its relative power. And if there is more than one compress, let's say, you can make the choice whether you want to use this in a low power environment or a high performance environment and then so forth. So we give you that choice. And the other thing, if the vendor chooses to expose, is how many instances of this function can run, right? So that count will automatically reflect, and this totally depends on how this function was activated. So with this, you, with this API, you would, uh, these two APIs, you discover CSFs. But the last one is basically what you would use to get that specific ID. And once you get that ID, the next step would be to execute. So with execute, we have a rec. Uh, the request is shown uh, on, on the right. And what you have is the request has that CSF ID we touched on earlier. So you provide the CSF ID and you specify the arguments or the parameters for this function to run. You specify the number of uh, parameters that are there and the, the set of parameters. Now what happens is, this is a very abstracted form. This may not match your actual implementation of your device. As you know, the APIs are abstracted. You have an in-between layer that maps the abstracted APIs to your device-specific implementation. So that in-between layer, what we, we called as plugin earlier, will do the mapping of this list of arguments into the specific definition of your program uh, or your function that is defined for your device stack. And what this API does is this API could be executed um, as a synchronous operation. That is, you, you can specify that um, I will wait till this operation completes, which means you don't specify the, the next two items. That is, the, you don't specify the callback or you don't specify the event handle you, you provide as a null, which means the API, you request the API to block till you complete this function. You can also make it asynchronous, and asynchronous could be the typical callback model or the event-driven model. So we, we give you this choice of three execution modes. And the last one uh, that you have there is a completion value. Now this is an optimization for those functions that uh, you just want to know whether they succeeded or not, or maybe you want to know more than that. They probably return, uh, here we specify a 64-bit value, let's say a checksum of some type, right? So you would get that back in the same request, that your return value comes back as part of execution. But you have, if you have uh, larger, uh, let's say, results that the execution um, did and we'll cover that by an example, then you may, you may need to use an additional API, which is basically copy the contents of the results back to the host. Okay, so with that, let's switch to the programming example. 
what we have here is uh, the figure on, on the left. So you're going to allocate some device memory. And once you have allocated some device memory, you want to load storage data in that memory. And once you have done that, you want to run a CSF. And here, example is a data filter. And, and lastly, once that uh, CSF has executed, you want to uh, copy the results or the contents of that filter operation back to host memory. So uh, four steps. How do we do it in uh, programmatically, right? So you allocate some device memory. So here you would need two buffers here. One is for your input and one is for your output. So the first, the first buffer is for load from storage and second is to copy the results. So you allocate them. Uh, CS alloc mem is, is the API. It's pretty straightforward. It takes the device handle, again, abstracted handles used here. You specify the size of your uh, request. Uh, you specify uh, right now what is called as mem flags. It's suggested as zero, but this is meant for expansion. We plan to use this for different memory types in the future, and we are touching on different memory types uh, starting with NVMe, but there could be other devices wherein memory may be dispersed somewhere else in your subsystem and so forth. So uh, that flag is kept uh, for future expansion. And then you specify um, a storage entity for to receive a memory handle. So that is your input memory handle or your results handle. And the last option is for those devices that uh, expose that memory, that is they are mapped into system address space, you could specify a storage for a virtual address. So, the, so here it is specified as null, which means I don't need a virtual address. My device doesn't specify, uh, doesn't support mapping that memory into host address space. NVMe uh, TB4091 is one such way. But you could have maybe an FPGA type model wherein the FPGA is mapped to the APIs. You can specify uh, to receive a virtual address, so you can use that virtual address to use file system calls to uh, load data into that memory. So first step, you allocate the device memory. The second step is you load data into storage. Uh, here is the code, total uh, code that is required to load data into, into uh, that buffer that you had allocated earlier. What we're showing here is this API can work with block requests and can also work with file-based requests. So this example shows a file-based request, which means the API has an abstraction layer that can convert that file information into a block request internally, so you don't have to do that. Uh, with some usages, like uh, where memory is not exposed, you have to go through this API, uh, which means uh, you, need, you need the support of file system built into your APIs to make that happen. Now, because we have a pluggable API subsystem, wherein you can have plugins that add a new feature, you can make this possible, and it is extensible. Okay, moving on. The next one is uh, you have allocated data, you have loaded data in, from storage, you want to execute that CSF that you had activated earlier, right? So you call uh, queue compute request, and this is, um, it has three arguments here, basically. You have the input memory, where that is where the data resides, the size of the data to work on, and then you have a output buffer, which is your results handle. And this is all this uh, query, uh, scan query is, is the CSF that is running here. That's all it takes. Now you could have a different function here. You could throw in a checksum, you could throw in compression, you could throw any, any of them here. But as the example shows, this is how you build with the API and uh, if your function takes more arguments, you just specify the number of arguments as in the second line, numargs, and then you build those arguments uh, as, as part of the request. Okay, lastly, as the CSF has executed, you would like to copy those results uh, that the sc scan conducted. So you would do a copy mem request, and basically a copy mem request is you specify how you want the copy to occur. And here what we're showing is copy from device. So basically you're saying copy from the device memory into host memory. Uh, 
and you, sp you provide a host virtual address, which is the second option there. And then you specify the device memory that you want to copy from. That would be your handle. Uh, again, it's opaque to the user, but within that handle you can say it is at this offset for this size. Um, and, and that's what it says, byte offset of this many bytes, and you do a copy mem. And once you've copied it, four steps, you have executed it. So let's look at it from another API I have not touched on earlier, which, which we call as Q batch request. So batch request is an example where uh, with competition storage, it is guaranteed that you have minimum three APIs to execute, right? So you have, you have your input data, you have your compute, and then you have your output data that needs to be copied. And instead of doing this in three steps, you could do this in one step with the queue batch request. Uh, there was a question earlier that you may have multiple computes in the pipeline, and if that is the case, this uh, queue batch request is the right API to do that. It, you could just add them, and you could batch them, and you can submit them. And since you have created that batch request, you can reuse that batch request just by changing a few parameters here and there. So you don't need to configure that whole request every time. You just uh, reuse it. So with that, uh, I conclude the programming example. I'll quickly touch on the APIs and NVMe. So I think Kim covered this in detail on what NVMe has and what's the, what's the work that is going on, basically the compute namespace and the memory namespace. We already have the storage namespace that we are well aware of, which has uh, NVM, ZNS, and, and so forth, and KV. So what this figure is trying to show is those terms we had touched on earlier in the last two sessions and how they map to uh, the NVMe, right? So we have compute, which is uh, CSE, uh, that becomes the compute namespace, and, and so forth. So this is the mapping um, that SNIA is working with NVMe to, to make uh, these two work together. All right? So with that, I'd like to conclude that uh, we have a rich set of APIs, well abstracted, but they are good enough to work with different types of device types. And we have a point eight specification that is out there. Um, we have other sessions on computational storage. Uh, please attend to get a better view of how things are working. You can also join us on our standardization efforts, which so we have on the SNIA side as well as on the NVMe side. If you all are interested, uh, please go ahead. Download that document, provide us feedback, tell us how we can make this better, that works for you, and help us build the ecosystem. Yeah, that's all I had. Yeah. All right, questions here. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, is there any arbitration for different resource types for your execution environment? Is that right way to put it? Yeah, so as you know, this is still at an abstraction level. That actual implementation will depend on your device so, and your execution environment. Right now, what we have done is we have provided the means to configure them and to work with them. That may be the next level of detail that we may have to do as we get to uh, maybe uh, you're probably touching in a multi-tenant environment and, and so forth, how are these resources going to affect each other? Yeah, so we, we do have some of it here. It is 0.8 and we still have work to do as you know, but yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so, as, uh, good question. So the question was, are you going to support SPDKs? As you saw in the, in the stack, the 
APIs sit on a high level. Your, uh, like I said, your drivers could be sitting in user space, and SPDK is, is, is an option that can easy, be easily supported. Yeah. If I wear my vendor hat, we did try something of that, of that nature at, at, back at Samsung, and it is possible, yeah. It's a mapping exercise in the end. Any more questions? Yeah, it should, uh, so, yes, like, like I said, it is neutral in a way that you don't expose your device-specific connectivity on whether it is local or remote. I think that is a property of your device that it is configured, as you know, in NVMe or Fabrics. You get a virtual device, right, and like it is local. So we are trying to use the same attributes that you configure it, for your device type, and you can use computational storage as if it is local. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> All right. Thank you.